Hello everyone, and welcome to our third lecture in the series on Middle Egyptian and Hieroglyphics. Today we're going to be discussing the non-alphabetic roles of hieroglyphs. These roles specifically are the bi- and triliterals that stand for multiple consonants, the determinatives that add meaning and contextual information, and logograms, notably not rebuses, which is a mistake I made in a previous video. Logograms are when a sign is used to represent literally what it depicts, as opposed to a rebus where it represents just the sounds but not the literal meaning, like using a picture of an I to stand in for the letter I in English. Bi and triliterals stand in for a group of multiple consonants. As you'd expect from the prefixes, a biliteral contains two consonants and a triliteral contains three. Not all combinations of bi and triliterals that are theoretically possible are represented by actual signs. Among the biliterals, probably about a third to half of them have actual signs for the, the possible combinations of letters in a given order. The triliteral percentage is much lower than that. Biliterals are very common throughout the language. A high percentage of words have at least one. And they need to be memorized in order to really be learned. There's, there's a lot of them that come up often, and there's no substitute for learning it. As such, in each lecture, starting from this one, we'll end with a brief list of some to practice. I'll be following the order in Hoax Middle Egyptian Grammar, uh, which is a text I'm going to reference quite a bit through this uh, project. And his order goes by the final consonant of the two in the biliteral, starting with Aleph and working our way down the alphabet. So that's what we're going to be doing. Triliterals are significantly rarer. There tends to be only one triliteral for a particular word or group of closely related words. Uh, only a select few are common. I'm going to present a couple of examples. There are a few more that don't show up there, like uh, the word God, Necher, has a triliteral, uh, which looks like a flagpole. We're going to learn them as they come up. No concerted memorization effort is necessary, and we're not going to attempt one. Just learn them as vocabulary items effectively, because they generally just appear in either one word or all the variants of that word. For example, the first one, Hotep, really only appears in one word. Uh, that there is an offering table, and it represents the consonants dotted H, T, P, and it appears basically only in the word Hotep, which means to be at peace or to be safe or satisfied, it's that general sense. Uh, shows up a lot in royal names, that kind of thing. The next one is Ankh. Uh, it is an ayin, an N, and the circle H or the Ach sound. So perhaps a better pronunciation, more Egyptian is Ankh, but we pronounce it Ankh because of convention learned from French, which is why it has that old nasalized consonant. This appears generally in words meaning life or related concepts. And then you have cheper, which does appear in a few different words that are that are related. Uh, that one's circled H P R, and it usually means something like form or manifestation as a noun and as a verb it means to create it tends to be associated especially with Ra in his role as the solar deity of the rising sun. There's another feature particular to bi and triliterals that we need to cover which is phonetic complements. Uh, this is how the Egyptians kind of indicated what was going on in a tri or biliteral by giving hints as to what they meant. Oftentimes, they would write down some alphabetic letters after a bi or a triliteral sign. If the letters started from the beginning, so let's say you have MN, which we're going to go over in a minute, as our biliteral. If you wanted to put the M first as a reminder, you would first have the owl for the M, and then you'd have the MN sign. If you wanted to use the N, you'd use the N after it. Uh, if you did both, you would either sandwich the men in the middle or put it before or after. That can be more flexible. And this is very common unless the biliteral in question is used all the time. Most words will have at least one phonetic complement. So here's an example. Uh, 
that one at the top is the men sign, MN. Is, uh, it's a game board for those of you who are interested in your origin of signs. And then underneath it, you have the letter N. And the way you would read this is just as men. You would ignore that second N because that's just a hint telling you what the first sign means. Now, you may be wondering, well, what if you want to write a word that was M-N-N? You can do that. That word actually does exist, or at least uh, the, a version of it does, menenu, with a W at the end. The way you'd write it is like that. You would put in a second N. The first N serves as a phonetic complement. Once all the possible letters in the biliteral have been expended, once you've written them all out, the next sound following after that is no longer a phonetic complement. It stands on its own. So this is menen. Uh, with the first N as a phonetic complement, and the second N is just another letter in the word. And then finally, you can get some somewhat ambiguous situations like this. We already know those first two signs, and the one at the bottom, that little round jar, stands for the letters N, W. This can be read one of two ways. Either that N in the middle is doing double duty as a phonetic complement for the last consonant of men and the first consonant of nu, and the is ultimately shared between the, those two, so you end up with M N W menu, uh, with the N having been written out a grand total of three times in for the one instance in which it appears, which is something that can happen. Uh, specifically, when you have two biliterals or a biliteral and a triliteral or something like that, and not just two alphabetic Ns, or the second N could be separate, and we could have menu. This is something where the dictionary becomes very helpful because usually a word will have a standard writing. Uh, it's rare that this will be ambiguous between a word, but until you get your reference out and actually look it up, this can provide a bit of ambiguity, unfortunately. So phonetic complement's not always the most helpful, but, but generally a good concept. This is not the last we're gonna hear of bi and triliterals, by the way. I understand that it may be a difficult concept, and when we go over readings in the next couple of lectures, I'll probably like actually point out all of the bi and triliterals and their phonetic complements and how you're supposed to be reading it because it's, it's just not easy. Also, you, you've probably noticed me pronouncing strings of consonants. Now, the Egyptians did not bother to write down many of their vowels. This is a feature that probably originated with hieroglyphics, but then went on to its descendants in the Semitic languages. Very common. Uh, the solution to this is simple. You just add an E where there is a vowel missing. And specifically, you make it a short, weak E sound, an E. So M-N becomes men. Uh, and you do this pretty much all the time, other than when you encounter a letter that is pronounced with a vowel sound in English. So if you see an Aleph or an I-N or an I or a W, you can easily just put in an A or an I or a U as appropriate and ignore that. Just example, Tutankhamun, that first part is Tut, that's T-W-T. -T. Tewet is a reasonable pronunciation based on this rule, but we like to approximate double U's as U's because it makes it sound nicer as Tut. Um, also, for the record, based on reconstructions, the most likely pronunciation of that is Tawat. But since we don't have the vowels written down, since the vowels are always up for debate, we just add an E, make it much easier, um, and that's how I'm going to pronounce everything, unless convention dictates otherwise in a word like Hotep, where everyone just kind of goes along with pronouncing it slightly differently than it would theoretically be. And note that if you're transcribing it, you don't do that. Uh, you would just transcribe the MN and then read it back out loud as men. The next type of hieroglyph is something that might be familiar to viewers who can read the Chinese script or any of the derived scripts like kanji or that kind of thing. This, this is because in both Egyptian hieroglyphs and traditional Chinese characters, many words contain a couple of characters and the ones at the end add meaning and clarification rather than pronunciation information. This is more common on words that are longer and rarer. It basically never appears on consonants or, pro, or not consonants, uh, pronouns or prepositions or that kind of thing. It appears very frequently on technical terms 
and you get kind of a sliding scale between the two of how often they appear. Uh, but they do always appear at the end of the word and therefore are very good as a way of marking a word boundary. Uh, you can just separate it out by the where the determinatives are. And again, this is something we're going to be practicing um, quite a bit as we do examples and that kind of thing. We start getting into grammar. I will point out where word boundaries are and that kind of thing because that's a difficult thing to master and determinatives are very helpful for that. Also, as a rule, determinatives appear before any suffixes that get tacked onto the word. Egyptian is rather fond of certain suffixes. Uh, specifically, they have a lot like the possessive pronouns are suffixes. Um, some verbs are conjugated with suffixes, that kind of thing. And the determinatives are always before that. Here are a few examples of some common determinatives. Uh, that first one is a tongue. A little hard to make out initially, but if you were to cut somebody's skull in half and look at it, that is what the tongue would look like, or at least uh, pretty close to it. It's a weird way to think of a tongue, but that's what it is. Then you've got some walking legs. Those are basically always a determinative, although they, do, they tend to show up on words for going or, or walking or traveling or coming or whatever. And then you have the I, which does double duty. It's a phonetic uh, I literal for IR, and it is a determinative for verbs of seeing, where it does not take any phonetic value. And the final type of hieroglyph is a logogram. Uh, again, not rebus. I'm sorry for any confusion that may have caused. A logogram is when a hieroglyph is meant to be taken literally. Uh, for example, there's a preposition. It's represented by the letter R. And it means two in its most common form. It has a number of shades of meaning, but two is a common translation. There's also a word that's just the letter R. It means mouth. And logograms are how you resolve that. Specifically, you put a little mark under the one that's meant to be taken as a logogram, and you put nothing underneath the one that's just meant to be taken as the phonetic version. So the first word here is mouth, and the second word is the preposition. Hieroglyphs are a little more difficult to read than other languages not only because of the difficulties in the language itself or the diversity of characters, but because there's no rules regarding writing, or at least they're not as strict as you'd expect. Most scripts can only be written in one direction. English is written from left to right, Hebrew from right to left. Uh, the old Mongolian script tends to go from top to bottom. Egyptian can do any of those. It can go in ro rows or columns. It can go right to left or left to right. There are two basic rules, however, that are inviolate. First, follow the birds. Birds are always red from their beaks to their tails. All the birds are like that. Uh, there are all signs, of course, have a regular orientation, but the birds are easy to remember, and you'll always find birds in a text, so it's very easy to orient yourself. And secondly, read from top to bottom. That is a misspelling. I will put in the description that it is meant to be read top to bottom, not bottom to top. So if you see a group of hieroglyphs clustered together, you read the first, in kind of a block, you'd read the first one, and then you'd read or at the top, you, then you'd read the next row down. And if you see multiple in a row, you would go in the direction of the birds in that text. So here's an example. And I'm gonna give you the opportunity to pause the video here and think about how you might record this if you were you were writing this down and remember top to bottom in an individual group and follow the birds from their beaks to their tails all right so i hope you've paused it and tried it out for yourself this is the answer uh there are actually two possible answers because there's a deliberately a little bit of ambiguity in there regarding this M, whether it is a phonetic complement to men or whether it's just standing on its own. Either interpretation is okay. It would be contextual. Uh, and then we do also have one triliteral with nothing helping it out here, that ong, and everything else here is alphabetic. 
hopefully you got this the same ordering of letters where you read your know, example in this block is netep because you read the first row of the block and then the next row and you're reading from left to right because you can see the way the birds are pointing next week we're going to be covering the basics of nouns and adjectives and really delving into our first real words but stick around if you're interested in practicing your biliterals I'm going to go over a list of them briefly uh, so you have the opportunity to write them down, take flashcards, whatever you need to do to practice. So we're going to go over the final Aleph by literals. A few of these have alternate writings that are not very common that I have not included. These are the more common variations. First of all, Ayan Aleph is a necklace. Uh, this one is pretty common. It comes from words meaning great. W Aleph uh, which is originally we would call it something like wa, but it ends up writing down the letter O by the Ptolemaic period, is this knot of rope tied like that. Uh, B. Aleph is an ibis bird. It is most distinguishable by that little chest feather it's got going on. Uh, that's how you tell this is the ba bird as opposed to another kind. Another bird for pa, this one is a duck taking off. And this one, the distinguishing bird feature is that it is in mid-flight. Ma is a sickle. Uh, if you note the specific shape of that, that one's pretty common. Uh, the verb for to see, for example, begins with ma, the, the famous word ma'at for truth. Dotted H olive is three lotus flowers coming out of a single root. Circle H olive is a lily pad from the bottom of the lake all the way to the top. Although in my estimation, it does look a little bit like a piranha plant from Mario. That's what I tend to think of it as. And then that line H olive, which is not a super common biliteral, but common enough to warrant inclusion here, is that fish with the hooked jaw. There are a number of variants for S olive. This is because a few of them developed for Z, and then they merged into S, and they all still kept getting used. The most common one is that particular bird, which you'll come to recognize because it shows up a lot. Um, it is a duck that, that is sitting, and it means sun, as in S-O-N. Uh, then there are two others that were originally with the Z. There's that weird series of knots on a rope and the front view of an elephant. Neither of those are as common as the saw bird. And then you have two things that look like podiums uh, that were for what was originally the S, that tall S, and then got merged in. For the SH sound, for shin, we have a whole field of lotus flowers over a pool. That was easy to remember because shin itself is a pool. For ka, uh, k aleph, you have these arms upraised. That one is also an easy one to remember because you will see it a lot. Ta has three symbols. Two of them are basically the same. Uh, they look like, like dowels almost, but what they are is a representation of land, like a field done concisely. And ta means land, as in you know the two lands is tawi, the, the dual form, we'll get in that later. And then the other one is a, a particular kind of bread. Uh, according to my professor, the Egyptians would, would bake bread in these ceramic pots, which they would then smash and get the bread out. Our final two, uh, that's not supposed to be pa. That is, a, that is a typographical error that is supposed to be cha, T underline, or, or uh, chima, aleph. And that is a duckling that is screaming. And then finally, a mortal and pestle, a mortar and pestle, in two slight variations for jaw. And that's all we have for the biliterals. I believe next lecture's biliterals will have a couple of different final roots. Uh, there's a lot of final olive ones. Not all combinations are this full.